Oh, Jimmy. Welcome to Cartoonist Kayfabe Spotlight. My name is Jim Rugg. I'm Ed Piscor. And our guest today revolutionized comics and what comics looked like in the 80s with his work on New Mutants, Electra, The Shadow, Daredevil, Love and War, and many, many more. Uh, his artwork extends beyond comics bounds to animation, movies, multimedia. Please give me a round of applause for our guest, Bill Sienkiewicz. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for coming, Bill. Uh, big question that's been on my mind for a really, really long time, and I appreciate you giving us an opportunity to sit up here and ask you a couple questions. But I'm thinking about the transition period at Marvel when you really started coming into your own, sort of towards the end of Moon Knight, New Mutants, and then uh, Electra Assassin, and the Daredevil graphic novel with uh, Frank Miller. Jim Shooter was known for almost giving clinics to his pencilers. Um, giving them sort of a rigid set of standards when it came to storytelling, six panel grids, mid shots, clarity, all that. You didn't necessarily abide by that stuff. And I'm real curious what he might've thought about uh, your output at that time when you really were coming into your own. Uh, well, his, I mean, yeah, he, he, Jim really did, did do that. Um, I do remember even having started in the back of the Hulk magazine with Moon Knight with multiple inkers, they actually came to me and wanted me to, to uh, do, they wanted to do Moon Knight as a, a I think it was a direct, it was one of the first direct only comics. So um, I remember I was so excited, um, but also I didn't know what direct market meant. And I am answering your question, by yeah, the way. Yeah, it's yeah, like, yeah. Do your thing. Um, I, uh, I remember, uh, uh, you know, newsstand and everything else, but direct, what is this direct market thing? You mean people won't see it, you know, at, at the spinner rack? And I had no idea quite exactly what that entailed. But I was so excited about actually getting my first comic book and getting out of the magazines. But uh, Jim, I drew the whole first issue. Jim had me redraw the entire oh. issue. So it was like, you know, because Jim, Jim had these these interesting rules, some of which I could I could understand. Jim, you know, having cut his teeth on the, on the Legion of Superheroes. I mean, Jim liked middle shots where you can see really clear storytelling, and um, so like you know a lot of the the later stuff like the Neil Adams thing where it'd be like close up of an eye and fingers and you know and people you know diagonal panel borders and anything to sort of confuse. Jim was like, I want no part of this and. Um, Jim wanted you to be able to pick up any issue in a run and just have the characters establish and, and have so that you know what you're, you know, who these people are, um, as opposed to sort of just having a multi, multi you know, issue story in which uh, you have to kind of already know the characters to get into it. Um, so, yeah, so Jim, the, one of the saving graces, I think, is that may have you know saved me and i've wondered about this over the years and it's going to sound like a really sort of bizarre um identity politics thing but i think because jim grew up in pittsburgh and i and my grandparents were from scranton we're pittsburgh boys so okay pittsburgh. well there you go it's like um i think there's some polish there's some polack there's some polish in uh in shooter and i think we bonded over that so I don't know if it was this mutual sense of like sympathy or, um, you know, like, I mean, I, I, you too, huh? You know, um, but uh, we became we became friends I and mean, we used to go out to dinner and stuff like that. So I think I think there was he never didn't give me crap, <laughs> but, but it was, was always sort of, sort of tongue in cheek. And, you know, and I think that as crazy as as he thought I was. Because at the time that I, when I came in and I was doing the Neil Adams thing, um, uh, I'd already at that point I I had sort of drawn like like I wanted I loved Neil I wanted to do comic books and I still wanted to do comic books, and I kept drawing and drawing and drawing like Neil, and then when I got to art school right after high school, I sort of decided well I, at one point it hit me the you know the only way to like the only way to draw better than Neil Adams is to be Neil Adams. 
And I said, you know, maybe I can, I can, you know, go into look into other arenas. And that's when I started to fall in love with all, all, all art, all art, going to art school. So it was a, you know, it was a real uh, awakening for me. But I would, there would be no way if I had tried to come into comics doing what I was doing on the New Mutants or on Electra or any of that stuff. There's no way they would have hired me. So in a weird kind of a way, it was like I kind of um, Trojan horse my way in, you know, um, not intentionally. Um, it wasn't until midway through there, uh, through Moon Knight that the the feedback, uh, the negative feedbacks really started to kick in in terms of this guy's nothing but a clone. It, you know, reviews were, you know, Bill Sienkiewicz looks like he, you know, he, he learned to draw from Neil Adams, you know, ellipses, period, you know, and I just felt like, and meanwhile, my sketchbooks were full of, of you know, fashion, like t- style drawings and collage and everything else I, that I, I really loved. And uh, so I, I felt, I started to feel incredibly invisible because when I was growing up in, in the farm country, of New, York, you know, New Jersey, and I fell in love with Neil's work and I wanted to do comics, it's like, that's the that's the stuff, man, right there. And I'm just going to keep on trying to do it and just improving, improving, and, and improving. And um, there was no adult around or no other artist to really say, you know, but you have to be yourself, man. You know, you know, it's like this uh, copying thing is good for sketchbooks, but, but, you know, so um, I almost felt like I was being judged and um, like deleted. From from my own, from being part of the you know the process at all, I felt completely invisible. So what happened was it was like I'm either I, I remember I I just decided, well I'm either going to do all the things that that uh, that I want to do that it's in my sketchbook and everything I've learned, or I'm going to get out. Mm-hmm. So um, I mean it was it, it's like trying to take uh, you know some depression or anger. Um, and you know, a lot of times I think I've learned that depression for me is anger that I just aim it inside. And so what I, you know, and I, there's a part of me after a certain point of, of that, I'll just be like, no, I, and then I get angry and then I want to do something different. I want to do something about it. And, um, so I just started pushing, you know, little bits of, of, uh, illustrative stuff or more fine art stuff into the later, like around the Morpheus issue. So it didn't happen right away but um but there were a number of things along the way that sort of um sparked the change um and i you know and i know i'm going on at length but uh you know i will say that that there were there was a time then especially after i left moon knight where i would uh when i started on on the new mutants where i really felt like i wanted to cut loose Uh, that's when shooter you know to get back to your original how did he feel about it he t- used to take great joy in inviting me into his office to read the the letters from the, from the, the feel good letters, right? Yeah. yeah. Well, well, my favorite one was was stop him, Jim, before he kills again. I thought that kind of encapsulated it. Yeah. And the, perversely, I took great pride in that. You know. Anyway. I know I know it was a long answer, but you know, sort of trying to provide a little bit of context for the yeah, that's great. So, Um, one of the questions I had, you know, we're both artists, and and certainly I've drawn a lot of inspiration from you over the years. And looking at that period of time, a lot of cartoonists they go to art school. Very few of them go through radical changes that you put on the page. And I'm curious about you know what you were looking at in New York at the time, what New York was like, what was kind of compelling you. Uh, you know, specifically at that time period around you, other artists, you know, you mentioned fashion illustrators. Were there any standout artists outside of comics? Oh, there was a slew of, of artists that I, that I really admired. Um, in art school, um, I started studying a lot of the contemporary illustrators, um, like at the time, like Bob Peake, who was, you know, uh, doing movie posters, Bernie Fuchs, who um, was doing a lot of stuff for, for women's magazines and, and, Sports Illustrated, TV Guide covers were big. You have to, I mean, people now, it's like, you, you know, the idea of an actual, like, Sports Illustrated, I don't think it hasn't had an illustration in, it in like, ages, you know? So it's like, uh, you know, talk about truth truth in advertising, you know? Um, but at the time, those 
those covers were and and those that kind of work was pretty ubiquitous you know um as if anything could be pretty ubiquitous but um <laughs> it either i guess it either is or isn't but that's all you know but um uh so when i you know starting to like when i was looking at, at a lot of that stuff and then fine art and and studying the impressionists and, and gustav klimt and everything else um and it was it was actually after i got married and moved from new jersey to westport connecticut that was also a big part of it so right pro, like in the earlier mid issues of um moon Knight, um you know i was i was actually I had a studio with you know with stan drake and and um uh, you know Leonard Starr and those guys, so um, that I would I would visit with them. And then after I got divorced um, in my early twenties, that's when I sort of um, I wanted to gravitate more toward artists that I, you know and be around them all the time. And then in the city, because I also had a uh, I had a studio in in Westport where I lived, and then I had a studio that I rented in New York as well. With I mean, worked with Dennis Cowan. And um, Michael Davis, and in the very next room at, in New York was Howard Chaikin, Walt Simonson, uh, I believe Jim Sherman, who was an advertising artist, and there may have been one more, but I think Frank Miller had moved out by that point. So yeah, it was it was, and then in this being in the city, all, every day I would go to galleries, I'd go to museums, or I would stop at children's bookstores, you know, and just like. Because most of the abstract stuff that was being done was was being done in, in kids' books, you know, and then just reading, read like uh, I really got into Hunter Thompson. So I, you know, and David Lynch. It was like I sort of at that very young age I was sort of becoming, you know, like a, a sponge, more and more of a sponge. I think that's one of the influences that now permeates comics, where cartoonists are looking outside of comics. It feels like you were one of the early guys to do that, to look to film directors, to look to picture book, uh, which I find to be a very rich area, but not one that you hear a lot of cartoonists talk about or cite. Um, you certainly seem like you were maybe on the front edge of that, of looking at well, some of this yeah, other media. Well, yeah, I mean, maybe in terms of, of comics, it's kind of an anomaly or a first or whatever, but to me, I sort of feel like what I was doing was just, you know, living my life and just being influenced by everything around yeah. me. I would, and, and, and I, I think, think that, that sometimes I think there's a a mechanism that we, when we're working on a job or something, especially something we want, that it's like we're doing everything that fits the, the what we believe are the requisites to keep the job, which means that, you know, if you're going to do comics, like no comics, right. and, you know, and study them. And um, because I, I drew on comics ever since I was a little kid, I sort of feel like I loved them. I felt like I, I really knew how to do them, but it's like I could uh, take them or leave them. But I it's like, you know, that old thing about, you know, if you love something, set it free. It's like I I moved away from it, but I realized, no, this medium, I just love, I love it. And um, and also there were all these weird prohibitions when I started, you know, and they persisted and maybe they still persist to some extent, um, you know, about like, you know, you can't tell, you can't use this, you know, with comics. That's not how comics, are, you know, are done. Like even the painted stuff, you know, that I was doing or the abstraction or whatever, it's like, you look at what's being done in Europe. So a lot of the stuff may, that I pulled from is stuff that's out there. You know, it's all all there. I guess the the crazy part was that I I felt like comics can do anything and should do anything, and it was there was just no good reason that anyone could give me why not to do something. Were you conscious of you know there's there's an art comics movement going on out of the underground and into the art comics of like Raw magazine mm -hmm. at the time was that something you were looking at then? Well, when I was growing up, um, I never I even I don't think I I went to one comic convention in New York because um, I lived about three or four hours away um, by tr by bus or or whatever from from New York City. Um, and it's like, you know, going to New York was like a like a once a year thing. And that was maybe to go to a ball game, a Yankee game with my father's, you know, like uh, workplace of business. They'd rent a bus, you know, and, um, and, you know, and then take, you know, take the bus from New Jersey and just listen to a bunch of drunken white guys just be racist up and down through, you know, it's just and it's like, yeah, I, I wow, I can't wait till next year, you know, so. Um, 
He's like, I, the embarrassment would usually wear off by then. Um, but uh, I'm, I'm sorry, sorry, what was the question? Here, I wonder, here <laughs> were, one of the, you know, we have copious notes here, and we've read many <laughs> oh, interviews and all sorts of stuff in preparation for this. Um, there was a famous comics journal interview, 85 or so, um, highlighting Electra Assassin. Uh, reading that interview, you're really coming into your own. It really seemed like you were you were a man on an island. There wasn't anybody else making comics or anything like you. The closest cartoonist that we can think of who would have been doing anything outside of the box would have been the cartoonists uh, under uh, on the tutelage of Art Spiegelman and Raw Magazine. Right. Did you have any connection to that stuff? Well, I, I've met and had some wonderful, you know, um, uh, connections with with art um he hates my work yeah 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 i mean that's that's at least what i've heard through the people from comic strip because he feels i and this is again this is i don't know if it's hearsay but it's it's i was informed that you know because because the reason i i believe it's it, it's it's the, in its veracity is that comics journal and and, uh, and again i love gary and like some of the especially like with with BuzzFeed and Bleeding Cool places now, but the reason I believe it is that to, people like to stir shit. So it's like, it's almost like he'd say it. So it's like, it's, it's sort of the opposite of fake news. It's like, you know, so-and-so's talking shit, hates your work. It's like, well, why would he lie? You know? <laughs> so of course I believe it for that reason. But um, but with art, it's like, um, I think he, his reason is I think even though I love a lot of the comic stuff that he did, you know, of course, the Eisner or Kurtzman or, or uh, you know, the Ernie Bushmillers of the world and all that. Stuff, I, I adore all of that. It's like and to me, that's like comics are all art aspires to music. OK, I believe that. But I, there's a part of me that feels like all art aspires to comics. And that's that's a that's an idiotic, both an idiotic and grandiose and, 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 and words of genius at the same time. It's like, it's like, it just feels like to me, it's a distillation that works for me. Um, so, uh, yeah. So I don't know if, I, if that's, you know, with, with art, I respect art a lot. Um, but for me, the, 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 the odd uh, thing of all of that is, uh, if you're going to be really, really good at something, I sort of felt, I sort of was, I guess I was just kind of disappointed to hear that because I respect him so much that I would think that someone who has pushed comics in such a, 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 a you know, a, a way was, it would be about the beauty of what comics can do and the language and the, and, and the possibilities that he would embrace something from the outside, you know, in that way. And so for me, it's like, I think it's a big tent. And if there's there are people out there who are doing something that somebody would say, I don't feel like it would be right for me to say that's not comics because who am I to say? It's like, I found my way. It's like everybody, and, and you know, I'm like, just do it. Like, you know, show me something. It's like, excite, make me excited. So, I mean, that's, that's the sort of, uh, for me, the idea of doing something along the lines of, of raw, I would, in a heartbeat, I would love to do something along like those lines. And I know that wasn't the question, but it's like, like, I want to, I love, I want to do that. You know, yeah, it's right. like, do my own, you know, pan, like, you know, weird things and have notary sojak in the background and that's that's a very esoteric thing i just said there so <laughs> so uh, so that just shows you how far my my how deep my geek geekdom hole goes you know one of the common threads of the panels that we've done this weekend uh, really does sort of illustrate that at least a while ago there were these uh, almost like tribal dividing lines in in comics professionals there was the indie comics people right. who shadow upon the mm -hmm. mainstream superhero people, and to some extent, you know, vice versa. So, you right. know, that's just bolstering yeah. those uh, right. ideas. Yeah, there is a yeah, there's a there's the there is still sort of that bifurcation. There's a kind of a um, a caste system. You know, it's like you know the it's like the it's the trickle down. You know, except in like the analogy, it's like the shit. You know, trickling okay. down. It's like it's just sort of the <laughs> shit talking. You know, but it's all, you know. 
it's all because we're, you know, we're humans hurtling, you know, through the universe and, and you know, the sun's going to go Nova. It's like, we're just, we're just amusing ourselves. We're doing yeah. our best. <laughs> right, exactly. <laughs> yeah. Keeping on that with that. I'm never this ex existential on Saturday. <laughs> <laughs> never. Um, st sticking with that uh, comics journal interview from 85, if we cut ahead, say, a year and a, a year and a half from that time period into, say, 86, 87, your Electra Assassin is, is firmly rooted in this moment in comics history where it seems like comics changed and the public perception of comics changed with things like Mouse, Watchmen, Dark Knight, mm -hmm. Electra Assassin. Sure. I wonder what your experience is like. You know, as we said, you sound like kind of a man alone in this interview in 85 well, where I you're thinking about way. this stuff. But cut to a year or two later, and, and you've contributed significantly to this change perception. Are you feeling that, or, or your peers? You know, what, what's that experience like as a cartoonist who really was ambitious and then gets to see some of that come to fruition? Um, well, I do know that um, I did feel very much like um, kind of an anomaly. And to be honest, I still feel that way, you know. Um, I, don't, I don't see what I do as, as mainstream whatsoever. Um, I still feel that, you know, it's like more like the Trojan put pit bull, you know, it's like I'm, I got in, but it's like, you know, don't, you know, or whichever other, like the pit pitties get a bad, they get a bad rap. So it's like whichever dog breed is more inclined to, to have people allow it in. And then it's the one that will go for your throat while you're sleeping. It's like, that's sort of what I would feel like. I, I feel like is I'm, I'm still the, you know, the weird the weird guy um, um, but a couple of what the when Frank and I first did like say Electra Assassin and I was where I remember working on pages and I'd finish them and I I, I did I mean painting stuff and then sewing pan, some panels and just trying to tell this tell the story in the way that I was telling it um, like I would spend the entire day in New York City I would go to like you know do maybe do some sketching at, at you know, uh, at the Met or, you know, and then like I said, spend time in bookstores or just walk around and just observe people or do sketches, get to the studio and just pour out pages over a couple of hours. And then I, I would look at the pages. and I'd say, I have no idea what they were and it, it, they were like uh, up until a certain point, I, I knew like when I would do something that was like, okay, I, di I did that. But when I was doing these pages, I felt like I had nothing to do with them in a weird kind of a way. It was like I, they were unrecognizable to me in terms of, so, so when I would turn them into to the editorial uh, department with, with Joe Duffy and, and Archie, you know, their response was, was, I, was almost something I really needed because um, it wasn't like, did I, you know, did I do a, did I do a good job? It was like, it was like, can you tell me kind of what this is? You know, it's like, does this fit any kind of criteria? Um, it, and so this whole thing that, you know, that you hear a lot about people talk about innovative stuff. It's like, you gotta be innovative. It's like, sometimes it's like, I, there was, I would like, Frank and I did not set out to do like, in a, to be innovative or groundbreaking or any of that stuff. I was just made that commitment to myself. I was going to do comics the way I felt that they should be done or that were possible. So it was this weird thing of feeling like I was putting together something that, you know, wasn't even Frankenstein. You know, it was, it was sort of like something that had never been, you know, didn't been tried before. Um, so when the issues first came out, the issue of one first came out and there was this silence for a couple of weeks. And Frank and I were pretty much consoled ourselves that we were like, okay, you know, it was, we gave it a shot. And, uh, um, because as disparate as all the all the pages were, or as, as esoteric or as crazy as it was, the one thing, and I was worried about it, but I found that once I put it in that cover um, and you stapled it together, somehow that psychologically gave it unity. It's like, okay, this is meant to be taken as a whole, even though what's inside, that's something about the whole processor packaging unites it. Um, and, um, but then gradually we started to hear some feedback and it was almost like, you know, people were sort of doing this, you know, you know, it's like, you know, like this Morse code thing to each other. It's like, I don't, did you like it? It was like, what do you, and it was all of a sudden it, it became like this big thing. And, um, 
Uh, but I, there was a little bit of vindication, but I remember the first time I went to Europe, um, I, and well, I was invited to Luke and, and that was the year that uh, I won the Yellow Kid for, for, as they say, bridging American and European comics. And that was my first trip to Italy. I mean, I've been to London once before, um, but that was my first uh, real trip to, you know, to a comics festival of that size. And when I saw all of the work of all the European creators, after being alone in the U.S., I felt like, I know what it is. I was born in the wrong country. Yeah. <laughs> it was like, wow. It's like the respect of, you know, that, that they had for artists and, and uh, you know, comics creators was so not, you know. I mean, even early on when I was, uh, I just started working in comics and, I thought, you know, oh, this is going to work great with the ladies, you know, you know. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I tried it a few times, and it, it was like, because people sort of, you know, people like people, people do that, you know. It's like, and especially if I told them I did comic books, then it's like, yeah, and and you tease animals with power tools, you know. <laughs> um, so there, so. Uh, I found, and I've, I've said this before, but it, you know, it, it's not anything I pr I'm proud of, but I got to the point where I, start, I used to start to play a game and I saw it. What, what, other, what other occupation could I potentially be that would like be marginally less offensive to them? And, and also conversely, what would be like a complete, off the rails sort of response, you know, in terms of, uh, so I, I, I found that pastry chef is, is a good one. <laughs> I mean, it's not like it was not, there was no deception involved. It's like in terms of, of ex other than, than joking at the, you know, no, it's, I, I draw comic books. And then of course it shits the bed immediately after. <laughs> We got into some of your influences earlier, the contemporary illustrators of the time. Uh, you brought up uh, Stedman. Um, mm -hmm. When we take a look at your sketchbooks and a lot of your comics work, they're, they're really, um, there's a lot of uh, geometry, there's a lot of shapes involved. And I know that there is some strong influence of classic animation text, Avery Chuck Jones. Absolutely. Can we talk about that a little yeah. bit? Yeah, well, I'm, I'm uh, you know, all about shape, you know, and design. Because I sort of feel like you can do a, a bouquet, of, a painting of a bouquet of flowers in a landscape, you know, with a barn or whatever. And um, uh, and I feel like you should be able to turn the piece upside down and still have it, something you'd want on your wall. So um, in a weird kind of a way, I don't I don't necessarily care about, like, I, for, for me, like with the later issues of Moon Knight, it was, a chance for me to do art stuff and try different things in terms of shape and storytelling and, and emotional impact of thing that just so happened to have a character named Moon Knight in it. Yeah. It was like, you know, it was it was more like learning learning on the job. And it was like, oh, and you know, like I think in Hit It, which to me that was the sort of big break issue for me in terms of realizing that I, I was more interested in creating a, a soundtrack for a story as a like a movement in terms of a, like almost like a musical piece as opposed to you know like another villain you know in a cape fighting a hero in a you cape. you plotted a lot of that issue yeah too, that right? was that, that was yeah that was but that was also and again i know that none of this kind of stuff ever really kind of goes to waste and you know what constitutes an artist or a writer but i do know that when i was in uh my 20s and i i was a heavy duty uh, beer consumer and a smoker um, and uh, I ended up breaking my drawing hand, um, being drunk, and I and it was like uh, everything that I'd been working for had just sort of, so sort of, you know, struck me in the face. It just it was a sense of of the self realization of horror. So I uh, I, I immediately quit, quit drinking. It's been like forty some years. I haven't had a beer. I mean, I'll drink a scotch occasionally because I realized I wasn't an alcoholic. I was just a drunk. Um, there is a difference. Um, it was sort of the way I was raised, but I haven't no no smoking. It's like it's like I changed my diet. I like you know I'm like a, and, I, and I started running, exercise, and I gave up and I ended my marriage. It was like it's like I'm in it for the long haul now, 
you know. And um, so, you know, for me, um, and I think I know I, I kind of veered away from. Do you from, think, man? This know, is the Bill Sienkiewicz spotlight. So, um, <laughs> so uh, just remind me the last thing the, the, where, where you the, you said in terms of where we were going because I, I the digression that I made was was for a point. So what was Chuck your Jones? Oh, the Chuck about about, about shape. So that, that was yeah. when I started to really study art and and about picture making and you know and values and and arrangement and composition and it was like I was going to put myself to school because to me college of any sort or schooling of any sort if they're doing it right they're they're, they're actually teaching you to continue to learn throughout your life it's like it's not sort of like here it is it's like and then then you're done yeah, right. you know it's like you you hopefully continue to learn throughout the rest of your life and that's sort of how I view everything it's you know when I was doing like straight toasters or uh, brought to light, and I was doing a lot of collage stuff, and then you know you get guys like you know people that I that I, I love my friends now. It's like you know Dave McKean and and Bisley and and Mac who were influenced kind of by me. It's like they're doing that like taking certain aspects and running with it. And for me, it was like I just you know I I really want to study subtlety and of uh, values and and always for me the main goal in terms of a distillation of how I view my work is that I want to, I, there, there are people out there who are technically phenomenally better than I am in, in they will, you know, I will never touch them, you know. Um, but for me, I, I always, I just want to be able to draw well enough to do something convincing, you know, in terms of what it's supposed to look like, especially if it's a likeness. Um, and well enough to be able to draw and, at my, and get my ideas across but I'm more concerned with how a, a, an image or how, the effect of how everything feels. So, you know, I'd rather do something that's academically incorrect but feels emotionally right. So, you know, if somebody's isolated, it's like I'd like to, you know, emphasize that, you know, in terms of how the work, the work wants to be done. The work will let me know often. Like I said, there are times I feel like I'm both the driver and the passenger, you know. It's like Tyler Durden, you know. <laughs> One of the things I, I remember reading about you uh, pretty early on when I was, I was much younger, it was like talking about style and it was saying, you know, if you had 10 artists all drawing the Empire State Building, it'd be recognizable as the Empire State Building, but it'd be different and in, uh, in Bill Sienkiewicz's would be like two miles tall. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think that speaks to the idea yeah. of if it's isolated. So I would know, do it really actual size, isolate. you know, yeah, <laughs> right. or bigger than after. I did it twice <laughs> up. Yeah, that would be funny. Huh. Um, another uh, piece, you know, as we're going through notes of, of your work, a big body of your work is what I would call commercial work. Album covers, book covers, uh, you know, working outside of comics and, and film and animation. Right. How does that uh, fulfill you creatively? I wonder if, you know, are you approaching that stuff in a way that's similar to some of this comics work where you're really pushing yourself and the boundaries? Do you feel that commercial yeah, work is... Yeah, yeah, it's, 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 a, it's a very fortunate thing because... For me, in terms of my younger dreams of doing movie posters and stuff like that, I sort of felt like, I mean, I, there was a point when the image comics was, was actually kind of a big thing. And at that point, I was uh, kind of, everything that was going on with like with, with toasters and with what, with what we had worked on in the 80s, like in terms of Watchmen and all that, I feel like the direction that, that what I thought was the direction that comics was heading was actually not the way they went. Everything went towards image, you know? Um, you know, and I don't know what, you know, tried to put it into some kind of context about how everything went that way as opposed to this way. And in a weird kind of way, I'm sure it makes some kind of sense. And, you know, I can't get into the whole, you know, mind, the process in terms of why I, I sort of feel that, but it, you know, it was like, it just, it just did. Um, but, um, you know, the idea of, of doing something, um, I keep going off on all these direct, di digressions. I, you know, it's like, there, 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 I do feel like I, that there was a point though for them, but, but the idea of, um, you know, comics going in that, in, in that kind of arena, what your, your point being finished that, cause I, I did go off on a, uh, well, digression. I'm just curious, you know, it's such a big part of your work is commercial work, you know, so you that, go okay, this very, okay, per was, very you, personal work to. I'm you know, confusing but, myself. But I, need more, I need more coffee. That's what I need. <laughs> um, 
Yeah, the commercial stuff was something I'd always wanted to do. So, you know, in line with, with you know, with what I, all that from me about two minutes ago, the idea of, um, you know, doing cut, like some posters in Europe, there, but when I would do them in Europe, I, like they would re oh, release the movies in the States and they'd be photographs, you know. So uh, I, it was nice to get these little pockets of opportunity to do, you know, movie poster related stuff or TV related stuff or, or album covers. And because um, uh, in a weird way, I, I, I in art school, I thought, well, I really want to do illustration. I would want to become a, a picture maker. And um, but when I did get that my career sort of started in comics, that's when I sort of felt like, well, I still want to do all the illustration stuff. So. Um, you know, it, it sort of feels like sometimes that, that I'm like kind of like a, uh, a comedian who does like, you know, TV roles or movie movie roles. But it's like still get me on, on stage with, you know, with a mic. And that's where I feel calm. That's what I feel comics are, you know. But, yeah, I um, uh, it's been fortunate to, to, to sort of be able to do that in the sense of um, playing around with other with even with with certain or, you know, styles. But. Creatively, it's um, it's a mixed bag. I mean, because um, you know you're obviously doing something for a specific client. For you know, and likenesses are a big part of that. They really are. It's like uh, like when I worked on Unforgiven, um, Eastwood, uh, whom I actually he and I never spoke, but through the art director, um, he said the last thing I want to see is four old guys faces up there. And that's exactly with the one that they went with. Yeah, you because know, I, I worked. They they went with my least favorite layout. As per usual, that's yeah, how it goes. Right, exactly. Right? Yeah, and I think, and I was also. Um, so, if anybody is familiar with my um, uh, Instagram, which is it's the real it's the real that Polish guy, and on Twitter it says, um, you know, art art uh, author artist that Polish guy. Um, ever that that. Clint, that was from Clint Eastwood. He called me that Polish guy. <laughs> and uh, so ever since then, it was like Dirty Harry just insulted me. I, my life is complete. <laughs> um, uh, so uh, even when I was doing, working on that, I mean, the, my, my, the one layout that I had that I really liked is not the one that they went with. Um, and, uh, you know, and then, of course, they used that, all of the work to turn it into a photograph. So... <laughs> How about the lightning round, Jim? Yeah, how about if we uh, name some names of, of artists, cartoonists, and uh, okay. you react to them. If you don't have any reaction, we'll, we'll move on to okay. another. We've got a big list. So. Okay. Right. <laughs> yeah, we'll, we'll hit a few of these, and then we'll do some, some questions from the audience. Uh, Richmond Lewis. Richmond Lewis, for everybody, if you're not familiar, is a colorist. She's a painter, but she's colored a few comics, including Batman Year One and Shadow. Yeah, Year, she's yeah. The Shadow. she's great. She's terrific. She and... and, and uh, Magic Kelly. I mean, I think they're, you know, I think, I think they're husband and wife. I mean, at least I haven't seen David or, or Richmond in ages. So, you know, I, I'm basing it, back, you know, prior knowledge, I, whether they still are or not, I hope, but, but she's terrific. She's, she's so talented. Did you guys, would you work with her to, to figure out palettes? And, you know, I mean, as a painter, I, I just trusted, I said, just do your thing, you know, and that's usually when I'm working with colorists. The only person I, I ever really talked about with coloring a lot was Christy Scheel, who colored the original you know, issues of uh, uh, Moon Knight. And part of the of our conversation was I wanted to get more austere and darker. I did. I, did, I said this is not a book about p bright colors, you know. So I think when I started adding a lot more shadows and black, uh, uh, you know, Alex Toth kind of aspects to it. Sorry, I keep. You know, I'm not back here, you know. <laughs> <laughs> I, can, just, I can vouch for the man yeah, as well. Right, yeah. <laughs> so. Next one, how about Jack Kirby? He's a man in love with shape. Yeah, I, you know, Jack's one of those guys and uh, that is like if he hadn't existed, we would have had to create him. I mean, he's, he was just like the master. Um, I, I loved his stuff when I was a kid. Um, after I, there was a point when actually it was when Neil Adams started doing all the DC covers that because I hated Neil's work at first. Um, and it was so much so that it was like he was doing all the covers for DC. And I went like, screw this. I'm going to read Marvel. It was like it was literally like an, an absolute like, you know, aversion 
you know, it's like, uh, I don't want anything to do with that. And that's when I started, you know, read, and then when I started reading a lot, a lot of the Marvel stuff, um, I just thought the characters were cooler. And it was like, and also felt, I felt like, you know, I felt like I'd, like I'd grown up overnight. I went from being like, you know, five to like eight. <laughs> <laughs> you know? I was like, yeah, I'm a grown up, you know? Characters with issues. Um, how about Jamie Hewlett? Ja I, I like Jamie's stuff a lot. I mean, he's, you know, and talk about somebody who's sort of just kicked ass, you know? When we were thinking about you and, and thinking about other artists and trying to contextualize it, Jamie Hewlett comes up because, of course, he has a background in comics, but he's worked in so many other media, has cartoonish, cartooning influences right. in his work and right. stuff. Yeah. No, I mean, um, you know, I'm trying to even remember. I mean, everybody, I think, I think everybody assumes that all cartoonists kind of know each other, you know, um, like, you know. The Illuminati. Yeah, I was going to say, yeah. <laughs> you know, we have all our, our builder. Bilderberg, you know, the, <laughs> eyes, the eyes wide shut parties and all that other stuff, you know? You know, some people walk around with duck, you know, Donald Duck masks. They do in stuff. Europe. Yeah, they, right, well, the, <laughs> yeah. Um, but yeah, but I don't think I, you know, really actually know him, uh, you know, if we've met, it may have been in passing, but he's, yeah, he's terrific. And, you know, and it, it's, to me, it's like, what other artists can do in other arenas with comic style stuff is something I also really love, you know? So it's, uh, I'm just always, you know, every day is just play. And when I see other people up, like playing and, 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 and make, you know, and crushing it, I'm like, you know, it's, you know, it's like, you know, win, win one for the, for the, the artist team, you know, as opposed to the, you know, the, the corporate client, you know, like oligarchy. I love the idea of play versus work. You know, I think that artists would describe their, their approach in those two different ways. And uh, that's a great description, I think, for your work and what I see on the page that you make, as well as Jamie Hewlett, that idea of play and fun and bending rules and breaking rules and, yeah. and really enjoying themselves. Yeah, there's a bumper sticker I remember seeing years ago. It said, a bad day of fishing is better than a good day at work. Right. <laughs> and to me, it's as, as tough as uh, I've had it in any, any you know given situation with, with my work or what I feel like I've accomplished you know, on a particular piece or what I'm fighting with. It's all fishing, you know. And it's interesting because the other uh, Thursday night, uh, um, yeah, well, yeah, last, I was I was actually at the Legion premiere for the third season, and uh, Noah Hawley, who is the producer, writer, director um, of Legion and also of Fargo, was actually gave a brief talk before they they shot you know they showed the episode uh, to the to the crowd, um, and he just said it's play, and I thought that's perfect. That's absolutely what it is. There are some great examples uh, online, on YouTube specifically, that corresponds with exactly what you said here and even earlier about being the driver and the passenger because we're lucky enough to be able to type in your name into YouTube and see many videos of you sitting there with a, like a bandolier of drawing implements, mm -hmm. drawing and painting. And there is always a moment where I as a viewer am watching you put these colors down, rubbing bleach on the damn thing, right. spraying it with stuff, putting weird gesso. And I just sit there and I'm like, all right, Bill, how are you gonna get out of this one, man? Yeah. And you always do, right. and it's always beautiful. And I implore everybody, once we're out of here, once you are back home, you have some free time, type in Bill's name on YouTube and watch these drawing videos. It's virtuosity at play. Well, thank you. Yeah, no, well, I mean, there are, there are plenty of times where I go like, man, I just, I drove right into the ditch on this one, you know? <laughs> and it's like, but part of the fun is like, is, it's like not having a kind of a game plan. It's like it, it's one thing leads to another. So it's 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 letting the peace, you know, sort of happen. But um, it's making a mistake, fixing it, making a mistake, and gradually, hopefully, the 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 ratio of mistakes to fixing sort of starts to to shift. The biggest mistake is usually that that one line too many. It's like I I should have quit just, you know. That's the one that, that is still, you know, where's, where's the person behind me with a hammer? You know? <laughs> you're, you're done. <laughs> you know? Let's do one more name. Pick a good one, Jimmy, and then we'll do the Q&A. Oh, man. <laughs> the pressure is on. Dave Sim? Oh, that's another whole conversation. Um, 
Dave, I, I've known Dave for ages. Um, loved him to death. We used to, you know, we got to know each other at a, a sh our very first show in the UK. And um, it led to us sort of doing, um, that's one of the reasons what, that led to like him coming up with the, his, his Kevich character, you know, and the Moon Roach and oh, yeah. all that stuff. And also um, one of the, uh, for me to do the, the cover of one of the Cerebus annuals, you know, which is, I just, I love his work. Um, the last time we spoke was maybe 10 years ago. It's like, you know, we, we, he doesn't travel far, like, much out of Kitchener and I haven't seen him. We've, we've sort of played some phone tag, but, um, uh, uh, some of his stuff a little has, you know, his, I don't know if he's tro trolling. I mean, I'm, I'm trying to figure out some of where he's going with some of his political stuff. Um, I'm trying to remember if we've ever had any dis discussions. If, if you haven't noticed it's like i'm um i'm one of those progressive like you know bernie warren's you know swarren's folks so please you know don't i i appreciate your hospitality uh, <laughs> so so no but i mean but dave you know and i'm also I'm, I'm also you know for trans rights and lgbtq rights and you know and and you know like the rising tide lifting all the boats so you know some of of uh uh, Dave's comments have, have sort of confused me and disappointed sure. me, you know, because uh, um, I would be curious to talk to him about about it, you know. Um, not that I could change his mind, but uh, right. just to go. <laughs> <laughs> All right, yeah, um, let's take, uh, we have time for a few questions. Uh, yeah, as you were talking about paneling, I just, I love your work. Thank well, you. Thanks for being here. Thanks, thanks so, so much, much for having me. Really us. appreciate it. Uh, Serenko came to mind. And uh, you know, where does he sit for you in terms of, uh, again, in Harville, maybe influences? And in any of those editorial meetings, does Serenko's name ever come up? He's on our list. Go ahead. Well, uh, well Jim, uh, Jim and I, I mean, get along great. It's like, you know, uh, I love him. I love him to death as a person and also his work. And um, Jim, to me, is it's like, you know, you talk about that phrase I used earlier about an anomaly. You know, it's like Jim is kind of, he's, he's as dug in as a tick in, in the history of, of, of creativity of comics. But he's also the, um, the anomaly in that I don't, I, I wish he had done a, a larger body of comic work. So I feel like he dipped his toe in you know, and, um, you know, and it was, it was a seismic explosion when he did. I mean, it was just, it just rippled out. Cause I think between Storanko and then Adams coming in, I think there was a kind of a gap. They were like the only two guys at that point um, who sort of were pushing, you know, um, but uh, I know he went on to do, you know, media scene or whatever. I think that was his magazine. If I'm not mistaken. Yeah, that was one of them. Yeah, that comic them. scene. Right, comic, and um, and then also you know working and doing stuff for you know for films and whatnot. Um, but I would like to. I've, I would really personally. I mean, I know he did some of his own self-published stuff, and you know, but as a graphic designer, I would have loved to have seen you know more more by him, you know. So, um, but I think he's he's like right up there with you know um, he's one of one of the, the greats in terms in terms of providing another level of um, to this, another aspect to the storytelling medium, you know. Oh, thank you. <laughs> Way in the back there. Wow. Yeah, I was wondering if you could uh, talk a little bit about how you wound up working on Marvel's adaptation of Doom uh, at the point that you did in your career and what you wound up getting any uh, kind of pushback from the movie powers of the uh, uh. somewhat idiosyncratic drawing style. Uh, no, actually, I I sought out Doom, and I know knowing full well that ad movie adaptations and comics, they're an, an absolutely thankless task. Um, you know, you're drawing Batman. You know, it's like in Batman with all of his grit, all of the things that you can do in comics. You're doing the Joker with all of his mania and everything else, except he has to look like Jack Nicholson. You know. It's like doing an adaptation of the Superman movie 
and having to show the wires that hold up the actor. It's like, it's, it just makes no sense. Like comics are comics and, you know. So when I was working on Dune, I chose to do it, one, because I was a fan of Dune, the, of Herbert. Two, I was a big fan of David Lynch. And three, I was listening to a lot of the police at the time. So it was, oh, Sting's in it. It's like, this has to be good, you know? <laughs> so, um, but I ended up having conversations with, um, with the film department, with the, the studio. Um, weird conversations because I was taking the actor, Kenneth McMillan, who played Vladimir Harkonnen, and I was taking and, and exaggerating him kind of like I was doing with some of the exaggeration in uh, The New Mutants. But I was also basing it on some of the way he was describing the books and also just because it was, you know, I wanted to make him huge, you know, and, I, and he had pustules on his face, except on one half of his face, and I put them all over his face, you know. And so I was literally having conversations. It's like, well, he's not on model. And it's like, okay, well, I'll remove half the pustules if you'll allow me 300 pounds in terms of, you know, it's like, it was this ne weird negotiation. And um, constant script changes. Um, and they had actually had relatively little that they could share with me in terms of, of reference. I mean, to just sort of get the, the weirding module, you know, um, uh, it was, it was, you know, kind of hard, hard pressed to have that stuff kind of be made available. Um, so I was almost afraid that it was going to turn into one of those early Star Trek, uh, Star Wars kind of things where it's like, you know, you know, where Jabba the Hutt is a guy in, you know, in, in you know, in Jodverse or something. It's like, <laughs> um, but, uh, it was it was a lot of fun. I mean, I really uh, I just thought I didn't really care so much about whether it was going to be a good adaptation as whether it was going to be a good comic. So that was you know, and I've had publishers come to me at movie studios and say we want we want you to do a graphic novel that we're going to like pitch to a, a movie studio, and I'm like, that's the that's neither the tail wagging the dog or the cart before for the horse or any of that stuff it's like you know it's taking all of those analogies and just you know like laying it out on a on a on a clamshell kind of a thing as opposed to you know it's 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 a, not just mixing metaphors i'm just is what i'm saying it's abusing them so um I, it was like no it has to be a comic it has to be a comic first i don't care what else you're 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 hoping it will be it's uh, yeah. Captain Marvel has a question. Hey, thank you for your service. <laughs> um, so when you're doing a period piece or a book that has a specific real life setting, what are some of your go-to reference materials? Are you using like fashion magazines of the period or anything like that for reference? Yeah, I um, uh. You know, there's you know, there's this whole thing about comics. You know, it's like you use you use photo reference. It's like you know, he's not a real artist. He's tracing. Or it's like you know, um, it's uh, or cheating. Cheating's a big one. I I um, I will go to like I have a pretty extensive clip file. When I lived in Westport, the uh, several of the most famous illustrators donated their clip file to uh, the Westport Art Museum, uh, Art School, uh, Westport. Library, so I would go there and I would, you know, if I needed a European lamppost, you know, circa 1940, good chances you'd find a street scene cut, cut from a magazine. So I'll do that. I'll buy, like, I'll go on, on online and I'll find books from a, a certain time period. Um, like right now, I'm doing a lot of fashion from 1940s, I mean 1920s. So and the Roaring Twenties, Paris in the Twenties. Um, you know, uh, there's one book that I'm debating about buying. It's I think it's a uh, uh, on Montparnasse, uh, and I think it's I think it goes for it's four hundred dollars for a volume. You know, a lot of times you can find on some sites for relatively very little. But you know, it's like I, I'm continually running out of of shelf space now. You know, <laughs> so it's uh, uh, but I I believe in in arming yourself with the, the right amount of, with the right reference. And then I'll, I'll 
hopefully cull enough stuff so I can actually uh, combine enough stuff that I can I can make some stuff up if I'm cartooning, and if uh, if not, I can also find models to pose for me or whatever. And I've and I've posed, you know, used myself as everything from like you know, Professor Xavier to you know like you know, Kitty Pride to you know you know, a small alien to, you know, a big alien. It's like, you know, it's like whatever, whatever it calls for, you know, um, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's just, you know, the acting and the, and the lighting and stuff like that. And then, and then having to, as Al Williamson once said, having to fall back on talent, you know, when all else fails, <laughs> you know, so. Yes. Uh, you mentioned, um, uh, Bob Peet's movie posters as one of their, their mm -hmm. influences, and one of the things it reminded me of is his. Um, I think he. I think it was him. He did. He did a, the uh, poster for Excalibur mm -hmm. for uh, John Borman's Excalibur. Right. And the, the thing that pops out of the movie, just like the way the light catches on metal, in that. That was a big thing. Yeah. That's something I really enjoy about your work too, and and um, <coughs> I'm thinking of like that the uh, Lila Cheney. Um, uh, New Mutants mm -hmm. uh, annual, um, it's like set up like a tour poster. Right. Um, some of the Conan work. Are there are there things like that where I just got the sense that you know, looking at your work, that that's something that you particularly you might particularly enjoy doing. Yeah. Are, are there things like that that you sort of look for or that give you particular pleasure to? Oh, I get to do this. Um. Yes. Uh, you know, when I was younger and doing things like that, where I was, I was, um, uh, you know, there are certain things that artists will do that are they're sort of very obvious. You know, it's like they become their trademark things to do. Um, and Peak certainly was sort of this, you know, these these wafts and like just, you know, virtuoso kind of sprays with the airbrush and glints off metal and high, like hot highlights and stuff. And um, I don't do so much of that anymore. It's almost like, you, uh, uh, partly because at a certain point you do it enough and, and it, it becomes, it feels like a gimmick and sort of, you sort of get bored with it. You know, it's it's like, you know, people say, God, if I could draw, you know, uh, I draw Batman every day or I draw, you know, nothing but nudes every day or, you know, or something. It's like, and at a certain point, it's, it's like you do anything uh, enough and it's sort of, okay, I've done that. You know, let me move. Let me find something else. So, um, so for me, what keeps me interested is is you know, and and now that it's sort of the arrow in the quiver, I can do that, you know, and and it's and it's gone through different iterations. Like I, you know, I looked at the, with, with Bob as an illustrator, his stuff was very sort of flamboyant and in that very 1960s, 70s, and 80s way. And over the years, I've gotten, I've pulled back to other more fi like refined or fine art piece, fine art pieces, where, um, with like with his flares, light flares, and things like that, it was almost like putting a whole bag of sugar in your coffee. It becomes very rich. So uh, it was like, so there's a part of me that was that thought subtlety might be things something that you know, because comics there is that perception of comics sort of being bombastic. And I'm finding that um, uh, since, since again, since I feel comics should do anything, it's like there's a part of me that wants with um, Parisian White, which is what I'm working on right now with Kelly Sue, is um, I, I, I'm, I'm actually trying to do less. And what I, what I mean by less is not less work, it's actually taking me more work to find the right level so that when it's not like Eddie Van Halen coming in and just, you know, just cause it's got to be for a reason. So I'm looking for the right, you know, it's like Robert Plant singing. It's like he used to, you know, wail on like the rain song or whatever. It's like, and he can't, he can't hit those notes anymore, but, or Sinatra, it's like singers. It's like, they make adjustments. They smink, they sing smarter. So I can, I mean, I can still do a lot of that stuff. Um, I just have no interest, but there's also part of me that feels like, I want to, um, I just also don't have the energy to sort of just do crazy stuff all the time on one, you know, on a certain job. It's like I want, I kind of want more of a cohesion, you know, so that when I do something different, it's uh, it's done for a reason, not just simply because, you know, it, it it's uh, me trying to find my way, you know. So it, 
and at the same time, I try to keep interested in, in like, you know, like, especially when I do the memorial pieces, because each piece is different. I take a certain amount of time a day, like two hours, if it happens to be at, at the most. And it's like some pieces are black and white, some pieces are color, some pieces are like charcoal or whatever. And um, so there's really no, you know, it's, it's from it's me trying to just catch the essence of the person who, who passed. So. Yeah. So to me, to, to answer your question in a, in a really long way, it's like there, you know, those kinds of things are all fun. And I think that, you know, when people would would copy me or take my style, it's like, well, I'm, we're going to do the, the the collage thing. We're going to, you know, cut out, you know, gonna do these little triangles or, we're, you know, which where I got it from Baron Story or somebody, you know, or they say this, they do the spatter thing. And it's like for some pieces I've worked on people, it's like, can you do your your your, your spatter thing? And I'm like, well, the piece doesn't need it. It's like it's almost like. If it doesn't have the scribble, it's like then, it, which in a weird kind of a way kind of reduces it to, you know, it's like, oh, I got to sing, sing Stairway to Heaven now, you know, at yeah. the end, you know. <laughs> That's sometimes what it what it feels like, you know. But anyway. What do you say? One more before we we split. Uh, your, your work is, uh, you know, very at times exaggerated and, and emotional, as you said. But you've also done a lot of uh, inky, you know, traditional art. And I was wondering, is it, is it challenging for you to rein in your kind of uh, expressive stuff when you're eating someone like like when you did Jim Apparel or something like that. It's funny you should mention Jim Apparel. Um, I mean, I've been, I actually, you know, people have asked me, you know, um, why I, I also choose to sort of do inks and finishes over, you know, quote, more traditional guys. Well, I sort of feel like, again, it, it's like a way of, of seeing how other people see things. You know, I find that fascinating. Um, and um, and also it's it's just it's a way to it's a way to to paint I mean to ink or, or draw without in a weird kind of way without like I, I have pieces that I feel like I'm I'm exposing every flat area of my skin to you know to a flame and it feels really kind of raw and if I'm inking somebody else's stuff I feel like it's like okay they made the decisions I'm just here to try to you know not mess it up so I feel a little bit removed from it but yet I'm still involved. Um, and working with, um, like with, with everyone from John Buscema to, to Inky Carmine Infantino or Stal Buscema or Jim Apparel, um, each one of those has been a, like an opportunity to learn something. And at the time I was inking Jim, Jim, I, I, I think he was quite elderly and I think, I don't know if he was having eye trouble, but the drawing that I had seen from his Brave, brave and Bold stuff, it was like it had... Um, declined to be a little bit, you know, um, it, it was missing some of the classic stuff about it. So some of his faces and things were a little off and it got li a little more boxy and blockier. Um, um, and uh, so they, DC approached me to, to do finishes over his work and asked me to, um, to modify it and to sort of do, do a little bit more drawing. Um, whereas when I inked Sal Buscema on Spider-Man, the editor asked if I could ink it like Scott Williams, and it was like, I, you have got the wrong guy, you know. And then, and then when I when I went, I did that sort of sort of more dark and abstract shapes with with Sal's run. Um, I mean, the, the, for me, it was like Sal giving me a big hug and saying how much he liked it. it was like it was like okay, we're, it's all good, you know. This is this is. The editor is one thing, the artist is another, you know, so especially if I'm working together with, with him. And when Jim Apparel, whom I never met, but we talked, we had a really great conversation one day on the phone. Uh, it was like an hour or two, we talked about everything. I mean, I was, again, a huge fan. But at the end of it, he said, oh, by the way, um, I have a favor to ask. And I said, yeah, he said, and forgive me for the children in here. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Stop, stop fucking with my faces. <laughs> and I said, you got it. You got it. And I actually went to the editors and I said, Jim doesn't want me fucking with his faces. <laughs> and they were, they were not happy to hear that. And I think shortly thereafter, it's like, I think they stopped giving him work. So, or... I don't know how well, how soon after that what that it was you know I but I, I didn't see as much of his work and I don't know if that with how short shortly after he passed away and I'm not saying there's a correlation again, at all you know um, I'm just saying that that it was like 
you know, once I let them know that I wasn't going to do it, 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 and then that's when you realize it's kind of a business and I'm not even maligning the editors because it's sort of like, you know, there are people probably breathing down their, their necks. I mean, one thing that I've learned, you know, over the, the years is, you know, there's, there's the integrity aspect of everything. And then you realize it, there's a lot of business. And the only thing that kind of makes it worthwhile in a lot of ways is, is, um, for me, like the two examples I just gave about connecting with, you know, with Sal, Sal was happy. I'm happy. It's like the readers were happy. That's, that's, that's also good. I mean, you know, um, uh, you know, and, and with, with, um, with Jim, same thing. So, but then, you know, there are other artists I work with, like Dennis Cowan, where it's just like, you know, we have such, such a, this kind of symbiotic thing, because we work, we know each other really well, and we work together for many, you know, so it's like, if he doesn't put something, I know exactly what he wants. And he knows that if he goes, you know, goes off, or if he, if he, you know, misses the beat on one thing, he'll knows I'll fill in for him. And, and, you know, and uh, so there, that it, to me, it's just a fun way to, to sort of connect and and uh, uh, and and there are days really when inking is like it's I can like when my grandmother like if I'm laying out a story or drawing or painting or writing or what doing whatever it's like I'm fully invested and then you know I'm fully invested in everything I'm doing um, uh, but the thinking process of how I'm going to pace something out there are like I there are times I can't have any music on if I'm inking though. It's like I can, you know, it's like my, when my grandmother and she and I would have conversations, she'd, she'd be crocheting, she'd be like, you know, and it's like, that's it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Get something to eat, honey, because you're going to be, you're going to be hungry later. You know? It was like that kind of thing where you can just do it. And I, that when I'm inking, it's like, you know, there have been times I go to the airport and I'm there early and I'm just laying on the carpet, like, outside, you know, with planes and I'm just, you know, it's like, the, like in my sleep kind of stuff. I mean, only because I've done it so so much, you know. But if I have, to, if I actually had to write something and you know get like, you know, there it's like, no, I don't. You know, it's like I don't. I I, I lock the door and it's like and you know if I had anybody if I didn't feed myself, it's like people would have to slide food under the door. It's that it would be like that. So anyway, so, so get, I know I I apologize. I did go off on a lot of digressions, but you know. <laughs> get what you pay for. <laughs> <laughs> One last question, Bill. Uh, do you recall what your table number is downstairs where the audience can find? I think it's uh, I think it's 901. And do you have a particular signing schedule? Will you be there this weekend? I'll be, I'll be there the entire rest of the day. I'm, I'm probably going to leave here and just say hi to a couple of people, but I'll be back at, at that. It's uh, Artist Alley 901. Yeah. And um, uh, by the way, love, love your love your stuff. You know, you got so. Listen, he clearly has good taste. Give it up for Bill Sukevich. Thank you, everybody.